podcast episode 25, Traveling R&D Podcast. This is your co-host, Alex Caravan, co stock manager of Baseball Analytics, sipping a spiked coffee that's not quite yet spiked, some cold brew from Trader Joe's, some almond milk, and some uh, room temperature vodka. Nice. What do you guys think? Is there a Trader Joe's near you? Is there one in West Seattle? Uh, there's a Trader, yeah. Uh, there's one, there's one, one in uh, near Dal Rico's. Oh, okay. But, uh, hit, hit, hit the intros before right. before we get distracted. Yeah, we Kyle, only an improvement from the last last intro. Kyle Lindley, R and D engineer, uh, researcher, big R, driving on baseball, mm-hmm. drinking a spiked coffee. Got some whiskey. In uh, oh, you also going spiked coffee? Mm-hmm. I didn't see the overlays. R and D marketing czar. There it is, baby. Anthony Brady. Driveline Baseball, biomechanist, uh, engineer, primary host of the Driveline R&D Research and Drinks podcast. Not drinking a spiked coffee. Drinking our sponsoring beer, Ruben's Brews. Is that the one I had in my pants like two hours ago? Ruben's Hazelicious. Yeah, it was. Also, when I was listening to the when I was listening to the Dan interview one. Uh, I said I said that like sponsoring brew thing so casually that it actually sounds like on the podcast like is our we're getting like a copyright claim they're gonna be like nah bro we don't sponsor you guys I can just see yeah. some listener being like oh shit they actually have like a sponsoring uh, yeah brewery. That, hey yo uh, that's how quick quick uh, sidetrack that's right, Barstool no. there goes Barstool, the yeah, right there D- Dave Portnoy started Barstool and he just put fake ads for like com- competitors of who we wanted to uh, advertise on his on his newspaper <laughs> so he would make his newspaper put on fake ads and then just like hope that it would attract more other uh, oh, wow. like more more ad companies have you been uh, oh. studying have you been studying like you know Stuff like that as as uh, the R&D God damn it. Are. No, no, I was just watching the the Barcel documentary. I'm just saying, man. I'm just saying. Oh, so but that was for the purpose of marketing czar tasks. Right? No, it was before. It was before quarantine, bro. Before I got the title, we need to, bro. We need to put like a marketing czar <laughs> counter somewhere. Dude, dude, this is a uh, Lindley. That that's I told you, bro. That's all Brady, not me. <laughs> yeah. I'm staying true after you, you put <laughs> me down, just, dude. I'm sticking. It's it's by, by all way, in by, love. And I just think it's like kind of uh, not from a funny perspective of like, it's funny that your marketings are, I just think it's a funny thing to constantly. Do, do you, what, why'd you change? What made you change uh, your title of researcher on Twitter? I noticed that Lindley. Searcher. Uh, Cause I had R and D. It was just a like aesthetic thing because R and D on the first line, R and D engineer. And then us. he's trying to divide us. And then R&D podcast on the second line. So it was like R&D right over R&D. And I was like, ah, this isn't a good, good look. So I'm going to change it. Plus, I'm, I, I haven't worked on any of the development projects either. First. So You heard it here first, yeah. folks. Kyle Lindley, anti-D. Anti-D. Kind of BS. You said it on me, dude. But anyways, coming off, coming off our, um, one of our most successful episodes, we'll, you know, hopefully we've at least retained half of the people that listen to Dan. Eh. episode first but we, we have we have a cute a couple cool episodes coming down on train this one will be kind of a two-week recap more like our similar episodes we got a live show and a few more guests lined up uh some of which we've alluded to at least one of which maybe will be a bit of a surprise we'll, we'll get we'll get through all the guests that we listed in our poll but since we already kind of scrapped the first one it was gonna it's not gonna be all in order um but yeah we, we i think you might have not had your headphones in Lindley, but we were talking about potentially having a live show next like two to three weeks. So we, we can coordinate that off there. And well, that's going to be the the norm, right? Eventually, hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. Having yeah, a yeah. live show and then also having it posted. So. Yeah. But I'm, I'm saying, I mean like, yeah, I, I don't know if we're going to do like live show for guests also. Oh um, yeah. That, that seems a little bit trickier to, to finagle. Well, I think we could do it. I think we could do it. Um, but do yeah, it. do, do you, you want to talk, start talking about yeah, just general update stuff uh, before we get into the modus the, the modus stuff we've been doing internally and I'm yep. plugging that now to, you know, retain the audience over. Um, I'll hit it off with, uh, yeah, we, I can't believe this is the first time I've thought about episode 25 that we're on episode 25, almost a, almost yeah. a half a year. Half a year. Actually yeah. crazy. Yeah, um, we've still made no money off it too. I feel like we should have done so. We we're about to though. Those Ruben, you know, quarter, quarter century or quarter of a hundred episode. 
Big fan. Um, I, I was going to make a comment about it earlier, but I, I've made a 10 and 20 episode comment. So I didn't want to be the guy that's like every five episodes. We made it, boys. <laughs> the, the, quarter um, many, mark, the quarter mark's pretty big, though. What do you think the number of people is that have seen all 25? Like, do you, do you think we have any person that watched the first one when it premiered and has oh, seen and, all and 24 up to this point? Like, on, I, I don't know, but if anyone can, if anyone can, if they can submit proof, like maybe like uh, internet history or whatever, if they can submit proof to us, I'll pay you a hundred bucks. Who would, who would be your number one draft pick? Uh, Ethan Moore. No, 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 dude. Don't, don't, don't. First off, definitely not. It's gotta be one of our I don't family members. I don't dude. think it's a real fan. I, I, yeah. I, yeah, I was going to say it's yeah. my, my number one draft pick is for sure. My mom and dad. I think it's, it's, it's a oh, Russian yeah. Fan, dude. I mean, families don't count. Oh, I mean, family. So I, I, I don't. I, I don't think like. Rules. Okay, yeah, that's fair. I feel like the families are kind of a given. Okay, so non non family then. Oh, that's yeah. interesting. But I mean, I mean, honestly, I don't even want to name names because I feel like you're gonna be offended. Like, the yeah, fuck, yeah, bro? Yeah. I didn't. I didn't watch every single one of your episodes. But like, I've only seen two. <laughs> yeah, we can, yeah. We, we we can cut that out. Yeah, we'll cut that. <laughs> Just kidding. We won't really cut that. We'll leave it in. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. Five episodes though. The, let, let's let's talk let's talk Anyways, uh, yeah. round of updates first Lindley then uh then Brady's and myself. So last week, last couple of weeks, um went in late Wednesday night and hit the high performance lab, uh motion capture lab. So high performance. Yeah. Yeah. And trying to train people to get as big arms as a uh, caravan. So we have at the old facility we had a little bit less of a permanent setup, but it was still like a kind of a like trust system and we had cameras set up with around the force plates so we could do jump force plate and kinematic analysis. Um, and we also used it for, for hitting there, but at the new place, it's only going to be used for high performance movements, strength and conditioning stuff. So got that set up in the new, um, and the new like Sornex, uh, structure, uh, cage thing, uh, with a rack. So it looks really good. Got it all nice and tidy. Um, cables managed. And then along that, uh, well, then that like area is going to be used for studies, um, for assessments. So eventually we'll have a kinematic and force plate jump analysis that all the athletes will come through and do. And then we'll also use that lab for uh, strength and conditioning research yep. for like jumps and squats and other movements and things. Um, wait, and then, wait, so do we have, do we have currently athletes going through force plate stuff at all? They're going through force plate stuff, but we don't have Not the okay. kinematics. Uh, yeah, we don't have motion capture implemented okay, right, right, quite right, yet. Right, right, right. So, uh, and then along the cable management lines, Anthony and I spent a couple days, uh, or like went in a couple days for a couple hours and and worked on cable managing some of the pitching department setups. So with the like desks behind the pitching tunnels, so we can have TVs for Rapsodo, uh, Edgetronic all of the all of the goodies for for like mound work and operation, all that stuff and make sure that's an operation make pretty uh cable management stuff dude, yeah. dude we, sh we should have we should have this overlaid with like uh one of like solder or someone's video of like the the gym inside you know or even like one, one like uh, us, us cable managing or something because i think this would be cool to talk about with like the actual image in the background or something yeah i think it'd be cool to do we could do a like or a little tour of the facility. I mean, I'm sure mm -hmm. the content from, from an R&D point. I'm sure the yeah. content team is going to do something, but let's be honest, our viewers would much rather watch us do a vlog style, you know, walk Well, I mean, even even facility. just say like what we're using everything for, you know, cuz it's going to be a ton of stuff. The yeah. the, the tour is just going to be like look at the space, cool here's music, desks, here's flashy, a bunch of clutter, here's a bunch of cameras. Come. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Be like here's why we yeah. use this I don't even know. Yeah, like like you point out all the all the cameras on the mocap lab, yeah. and then like where where uh, centers and like how many have to, you know, connect on all the points. Yep. Yep. Uh, what, what you what you got, Brady? Also, we need to do that just because Caravan hasn't been to the facility yet, so it'd be a good opportunity mm -hmm. for him to see what it looks like. I think I'm gonna break soon, though. I think I'm gonna break soon. You should, dude. Uh, you, should, nice. you should come to the Friday workouts. I, I I think I am. I think I think I'm gonna. Just like it's got to be a Friday. I'm not like uh. Super packed on maybe this coming Friday. This Friday, John? Yeah, that should be chill. Mm -hmm. That should be chill. I think we might Not go. Friday. We might stop by there today. The facility stuff has been uh, kind of kind of tough because uh, Lindley and I have to go in super late because we can't mess with like the athlete capacity right now. You know. 
Yeah. I don't mind going in late. Yeah. It's been it's been all right. Nice. But... Okay. You... Workout workouts on Wednesday, I think, this week, Kevin. Oh, really? Oh, the wad's gonna be on Wednesday? I think so. What time? Is it so like can't, after can't do that? Trying to go to two forty five. But but we go from we go from there to Pilchuck. Could I just don't want to hit traffic again, and I want to make sure to get up there well before sunset this time. Mm. Okay. Anyways, anyways, uh, let's, let's go. Uh, yeah, this. we do. We derailed the intro again. Uh, last week for me, things that I did. Yeah, helping uh helping Lindley with the cable management stuff here and there. Um, various various black ops projects that uh, hopefully we'll be able to talk about soon. Um, and, uh, the, uh, training floor research integration stuff, which we'll, we'll talk about later in the episode, but that, that, that was honestly most of it. Um, and we've been having so much meetings, dude, and, and crushing, crushing meetings. I feel yeah. Like. Yeah. Um, I get, the tangible update I'll talk about is the, on swing profile and as a hedge up to anybody there on track X right now. We we currently have a few things in the plans to aesthetically remodel some of our reports. So if you guys have any, but if you guys have any functional content feedback, um, you know, feel free to hit up our support team, or even if you're listening to this podcast, you know, feel free to 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 DM me as well. But um, the so I I brought in youth on our swing profile, which is a report that takes in blast data. It gives you a bunch of feedback. It gives you proprietary metric we met, we made to give you expected peak EV and expected peak LA from only swing data. So that's, that's, that's model's pretty robust. Uh, it's the only one publicly on the market right now, as far as I'm concerned. And by, uh, by publicly, I mean, even like the metrics out there and the validation behind it, I did in a swing profile blog with Tanner Stokey a couple months ago, but I brought in youth data recently and realized the model was just overfitting since it was initially built mostly on non-youth data. So I built two models now for, based on if uh, uh, the playing level of the player is youth, the youth model will, uh, the youth youth expected EV and LA model will be used versus the more general one. Uh, essentially what that did was drop down probably the average predicted peak EV by around a half dozen miles. Cause like I said, it was just, it was just too much, too much non-youth data. So the numbers are just getting raised a little bit too much. Uh, so yeah, just essentially have two models now to give you the most accurate and precise uh, expected EV and LA numbers. So that 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 that, that was like something uh, to take care of, especially before we got too many players or too many facilities with youth players on. Um, but besides that, kind of similar to kind of similar to Brady, just a lot of like meetings in uh, in the works, uh, pl- planning out still a bunch of edge reports and the aesthetic remodeling there. And then some some black ops works as well. Also built up some so, uh, some hype for today, obviously. Uh, first game, first game. Uh, oh yeah, Avs. Avs, Avs uh, trip to the stand. Avs in two and a half hours. So you know, very excited to circle back to that in the next episode. Um, and, and I, guess, I guess I guess two two of my things that I worked on we'll talk about as topics the 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 modus validation and the ROM research. But that's uh, very good, yes, dude. Let's get Nathan. Are you gonna Nathan McKinnon as a guest, dude. Oh, you think we have that kind of pull? No. I'll DM him right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I'll, honestly, I'll DM him off the pod, dude. I, I'm just gonna shoot my shot. I'm just gonna DM him after the podcast. Hey, I know you're busy saying, going for saying good it, luck. It, honestly, it's insane that we even like brought that up when there are actually like so many high profile like MLB players that we could actually get like not yeah. that, not that hard, not that realistic, and we're like, oh, let's get. Let's get a top three candidate for the NHL MVP that none of us have like even but that is that is something I want to do. That from. is something I want to do. I don't know how realistic it is right now, but I'm saying when we have two hundred subscribers, like I mean, <laughs> uh like I, I would love to be one of those podcasts that has a good amount of guest variety. Like anybody who's really clued in can really tell from Definitely the guests we have do, lined up. Can't do anyone that's done uh Bauer Bites or anything with watch momentum because our, our production level is just like embarrassing compared dude the to content's gonna be way package. different though the content's gonna be also way different um they have like but, 18 cameras like panning yeah. in on people while yeah yeah like talking yeah. and stuff and yeah. we're just Eat, like, like a, drinking a, a Zoom glass call. of wine drinking a glass of wine just a high def just like laughing out one of bowers jokes yeah. or something 
dude, when you threw when you threw the ball over the fence, man, that was <laughs> awesome. And then Bowers like, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. Anyways, <laughs> Caravan, I was gonna real quick. Are you gonna address the most tangible update from the last two weeks? You're now working in a closet. Um, I already talked about right? intersection overlay. This is Zoom overlay. <laughs> I was just trying to match you with the with the with the uh the, the blind background. background. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> nice. You want to... Modus time? Modus time. Yeah, yeah. So 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 uh, so um Lindley especially has been spending quite a bit of time on modus for people none know. Uh you know, we acquired modus a few months ago. And so far we did we've done I think quite a bit of front facing new work on like the dashboard and incorporating that and integrating with the track and all that all that kind of stuff. But in terms of the actual physics model and the modus results that we spit out, we've we've still been, you know, almost the moment we got modus, we started collecting data and trying to analyze against our own mocap lab and all that stuff, similar to how similar to what we did in our first modus validation study, which I think was published, I have it up here, was published in um January 2019, and and obviously that that data we started collecting years ago. I think you guys actually started collect, collected most of it in 2017. Um, but yeah, I think I think on the I think yeah the authors on that paper were myself, Lindley for some of the data collection way back. Like I said, maybe some of the processing. Uh, Bodie, yeah. Joe Marsh, uh, Michael O'Connell, and uh, John O'Sheffy. Shout out my initial John research. O'Sheffy. Uh, R&D partner. Um, yeah, I, I love I love Chevy's full name because I think it sounds so fancy, dude. John he o sounds Chef, like some yeah. some English gentleman in like the yeah. 1800s. Like, and we got John O'Sheffy here Scott on the yeah. on the paper. <laughs> Just instantly boosts our credibility. But anyways, really quickly, I'll, I'll, I'll let you, Doctor John O'Sheffy. I'll let you intro more in a second, Lindley. But uh, yeah, we started collecting data right away. Ran into some issues, obviously, just because of COVID, shutting down the gym, whatever. Uh, you know, having data wanting our data to match up with what's spat on the app versus like what we run internally from the modus code that was handed over. So we kind of ran another data collection process almost as soon as we got back in gym. Lindley uh, processed that data and got the matching mocap metrics, which he'll talk about in a second. And then I did some of the statistical methods and analysis. And then we'll talk about kind of that, where we're at and what we're going to do going forward. So uh, if you want to kind of intro the the biomedic part of it, Lindley. Yeah, yeah, just real quickly. So when we got that back, we kind of wanted to do more five ounce uh, validation um, just with a regular baseball. And then there are, there's like a, we have reason to believe that when you're throwing with a weighted ball um, on with a modus sensor that the model doesn't, uh, necessarily represent like actual changes in, in stress or at least match up what we, what we see in the motion capture lab. So we want to look at that and also intent. So, uh, but because of COVID, obviously we, we, it was a little bit slower, so we haven't been able, or it's like data collection has been slow. So we haven't been able to do all that yet, but just finished up the five ounce stuff, had to reprocess, um, had to create basically like matching variables, which we had for sh shoulder rotation and, for elbow load. So we use just the elbow varus moment to compare it to modus torque. We use maximum external rotation to compare to modus uh, shoulder rotation. And then arm slot um, is a little bit trickier because there's less like, there's less, there's not as much of a standard for what arm slot actually uh, like is quantified. Yeah. Um, so, and the way that Medi modus does it, it's a global position basically of the forearm. They call it forearm elevation. So it's like how high, uh, like the angle between the forearm and the, the ground. So if the wrist is higher than the elbow, that's a positive uh, forearm elevation. Um, so basically that angle, if zero degrees is when your forearm is like straight flat in any like rotation, it's just parallel with the ground. So we had to basically calculate a global position of, of the forearm segment as opposed to, as opposed to like elbow flexion angle, shoulder abduction angle, lateral trunk tilt, um, so, which we compared as well, but, um, so we had to do that and then, um, calculate also, uh, the arm speed is also calculated as like a global forearm rotational velocity. So we had to in include those two things in the process or in our like pipeline, uh, output them, put them together in a paired like data frame and then uh, ship them to the caravan, which is how most of like the study analyses go. It's like we collect it, process what we need to get it into, uh, 
like a ho- hopefully one like centralized data frame and get it to caravan for like statistical analysis. And this is reminding me, I think I think I still need. I totally forgot about the pull down study, dude. I, I write, I, I I go through various phases where I like write all my to dos, or, or or like all my pressing stuff on like a sticky notes or whatever, and then they'll get bumped by like pressing stuff, and I'll rewrite them. And I just forgot that I still haven't done a pull down study. Obviously, not super high priority, but uh, yeah, I mean that, and obviously the last write up just been mad slacking on it, or just been like yeah, shoving it's it to the. Type of stuff. Yeah, yeah, but but I just remembered the, the pull down study now talking about it. <laughs> um, but I mean, not that you know, the the, the also the on, on those studies right now, we're way more backed up on writing than analysis, I think. Yeah, originally I was like, let's get the let's get the pull down study like analyzed and everything so we can get it also into the writing phase. So now that we have yeah. all the studies in writing, we can just like hammer them out, and that's just like definitely not how it's going. Yeah, <laughs> so I don't, it's like less of a less of a priority for me to get all the pull down stuff together. Anyways, yeah. So, so like Lindley mentioned, um, I looked at paired mocap and modus data across a couple metrics, like all the modus metrics, and then the corresponding mocap metrics that Lindley has talked about deriving uh, weight, ways. You know, like essentially, I'll approach this from like what I what I kind of did, the methods I used, and then we can kind of talk a little bit about some of the results and why the results could be different from our validation study that was published and then what we're yeah looking to do for going forward. Um, a lot of the stuff was essentially looking at two main ways uh, of analyzing it. Similar to the study, we focus on reliability, which is, you know, colloquially known just as correlational analysis. Do the, do the metrics all increase in the same direction? Do they decrease in the same direction? Um, like if, if, you know, what, like they take into account user averages, throw averages, repeated measures correlation. So uh, associating some of the intra individual association, AKA like for each individual player, do the metrics directionally correlate in that case? Do they correlate when you look at a clump of uh, people? So uh, I looked at it. I think the number of I took out a couple outliers, a couple of people that were clear outliers. So I was left with about 34 pitchers and around 85 to 90 pitches. Uh, did a lot of visual representation as well, but I did correlations on each throw, correlations on user averages, and then repeated measures correlations, which is uh, again like a, a, allowing for the standardization of you know the lack of independence among the data points that are associated with the same people. So again, measuring kind of within the subject correlation um, and probably across the, across the board, numbers were a bit lower than our modus validation study. Well, a, a bit, yeah, like, like I was looking at them now, I don't think I'd even spend that much time comparing the magnitudes. Uh, our, Varus, our, our Varus to torque wasn't too far off. Yeah. Um, arm speeds were a bit lower. Shoulder rotation was still fairly robust. Uh, one of our arm stall metrics were, was pretty decent, but the, the arm stall metric we found in the, in the modus validation study it was much, uh, you know, correlated much higher. Uh, some of some of the reasons I kind of came up with, and my theories on why they were different, why the numbers were different. Uh, first off, we have a difference in number of subjects and data points. I think when we did the modus validation study, we had ten subjects, and that threw fastballs. That, that threw each like a fastball or each through like three fastballs and three breaking balls. It was five. I think it was five for uh, each pitch type. It was five for each pitch type. Okay. I believe so. Okay. Uh, should probably so like a slightly higher. Uh, yep. 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 You're right. Five. This, it, it says even five to seven. I think we just, I think we just chose the five ones that had the most that were just to capture the best on mocap. Whereas here we took like two to three pitches per guy and it was, Mostly, I think the idea was fastballs, right, Lindley? Mm-hmm. Yeah, because we just yeah. use assessment data for when yeah. guys uh, came and assess, they just threw with yeah. a mode of sleep on as well. Yeah, and and also in the validation study, we used just user averages rather than also looking at repeated measures, correlations, that kind of stuff. So what I suspect is that among two to three throws, maybe the within subject correlation isn't as evident, right? Because one slight misread or one wonky value will just plummet that if there's only two to three data points. If there's five to seven, that's another story. 
So I suspect that, and plus we used user averages, like I mentioned. So I suspect around five to seven throws, maybe the modus metric stabilized much better than do at two to three throws. And matching those of our mocap values in that case uh, would have different relationships. Also, technically, a lot of the, or technically our motion capture metrics, some of them are slightly different from, we probably were on uh, pipeline V3 back then, although it was a lot, lot, lot looser and a lot less standardized than it is now. That, there was a different model. Yeah. Right, right, right. That's what like, I mean by, I by, model, by pipeline. Model definitions is probably a big thing. Even the, yeah. you know, marker placement. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, 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 yeah. So our, like our thoughts, uh, or at least my thoughts that, that Lindley seemed to agree with as well, um, is we need to, we, we just need, we, we need to like rerun stuff at, with more throws, like kind of mocap and modus larger sessions yep. as a whole, and then match those players across, you know, multiple data points and also talk about varying intent levels as well to see if that is fun, something yeah. that, it, that, it, that impacts like the way numbers trend up and down. Um, so I think like some of the ideas we talked about is having a, having like multiple people mocap and modus five plus throws in a session, have them do multiple sessions. We look at like the variance in that subject across different sessions, potentially vary intensity across those sessions. So we also look at intro session variance and just like how much a, like how stable those numbers are with more data points with different intent levels and with the same person throwing them on like different days. Yeah. Uh, so uh, definitely a couple of things in the works. And like, I think the main takeaway for me is there's still, there's still work, like, you know, there's still plenty of stuff that we're still doing with modus in terms of understanding it, understanding how it works. And it's like a high priority of ours to fully understand it and like have, answers for like these questions as well yeah and hopefully especially if like if people are using it for workload yeah uh primarily it's a that's based on the stress value and if we we want to make sure that the stress value at the very least yep. is um good enough and the stress value was pretty good the stress value is like the i think our um highest correlation around like uh 0.6 or so mm -hmm. outside of um like the what I would mention before about maybe, maybe not responding to different ball weights, uh, quite, mm -hmm. quite correctly, but that's, that's something that we are currently collecting data on to try to provide a solution. Uh, and then also just kind of like tacking, if you're, are you, you done, uh, with the five ounce validation stuff discussion? Yeah. 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 I mean, I mean, I was just curious, like if you wanted, uh, I mean, feel free to talk more about like, Motive, if you had if you had anything else as well, just like planning, playing stuff out. Yeah, no, I just think in terms of ongoing research. Yeah, I just think that um, I do think that it's it's like correlated enough where I think it yeah. it can clearly tell a directional difference between athletes, uh, mm -hmm. or between like elbow load between athletes, whether or not that's super accurate to the actual newton meter value of of stress. Um, we don't know, but we know that. We or we, I could be confident that um, two different athletes. One athlete has much higher elbow load um, in motion capture, and then the other. I can be confident that Modus is going to be able to detect detect a uh, difference between the two. Yeah. Um, but I think within within subjects is a little bit concerning with a low uh, like interest subject uh, or reliability value. Mm -hmm. I think it's like important that we do get some like caravan was saying get some like larger uh, more more replication in our uh like within subject data collection so that we can be sure that within the same guy uh if he or within the same thrower if they are varying the the intent levels varying the ball weights varying whatever drill they're doing that that is at least somewhat accurate mm -hmm. so that the workload and the stress can be uh can be as valuable as possible because if, if stress says, or if modus says that stress is going up, therefore providing a greater workload, if they're, uh, if stress isn't actually going up, right. then it's going to lead us to probably change programming, maybe decrease volume, maybe decrease intensity or something in which are in like in a case where they actually probably shouldn't be.
So uh, yeah. that's like a lot of a lot of what this like more like further work needs to get into. And then on top of the five ounce validation, we also like Modus had kind of in the beta stages. We have some like multi sensor things, some other applications uh, that I've been messing around with in the last couple of weeks. And the one that I think I'm most excited about right now is a single sensor like jump uh, test, like jump protocol. So basically you just like throw a sensor on it. I believe it goes on your pelvis and you do a, a vertical jump with your left and right leg. And then it gives you vertical peak velocity, vertical force. Um, you, you do a lateral broad jump. It gives you lateral uh, velocity, lateral force. And then you do a rotation you, uh, like a med ball throw to the left and to the right and then it gives you a rotational velocity and rotational torque uh, uh, i don't even, even know about yeah. this i didn't know about it until a couple of weeks ago and then and messed around with it and it was like as far as usability like some of the multi-sensor like some of the uh beta stage pro- products that are in that like uh suite of tools for our modus are a little bit more buggy like uh connectivity problems and whatnot just as like that's a common thing with sensors we saw the same thing with notch um, but the, the force velocity one, it was just like very straightforward, didn't have any bugs or anything. It seemed pretty consistent. And I think that that could be a really good tool for, uh, online training because we don't currently really have, um, or we don't have an objective like jump assessment with, uh, remote trainees. Um, even though we can test like one rep maxes or three rep maxes or whatever, cause they could just do that in the weight room by themselves or with a spotter. Um, yeah. If we if we're able to like do something with modus and and force and jumping and stuff, we can provide even more analysis and programming insight uh, from afar. So that was so, really so, exciting. So who's who's work who's been working on this? It's, or is it who's just a sensor that already existed and that, that's kind of been like not marketed too 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 much or what? Yeah, yeah. There's like modus did a bunch had a bunch of different applications. They had yeah. e- even like rehab uh, applications. So that we like haven't even really looked into yeah. or like touched. So, um, so yeah. And, and, and I was gonna say that that's kind of one of the things that like I, I, I kind of left you hanging on kind of was like mentioning just essentially you've, you've probably been the, the main, I mean, you've definitely been the main person like uh, looking at the specific like physics model and the research there for, for modus. And I think, like even just like the stuff we've talked about now, maybe show some clarity because I, I like I'm I'm sure some people who knew of Modus, knew of us, saw the partnership. Like I said, a lot of a lot of front end facing updates have come out in the last couple months uh, that have made the app hopefully easier to use. If you know, feel like drop any feedback to Dreadlin support or if that's not the whatever case, channels of feedback know. exist. Yeah. Um, you know, if you don't like it, that's definitely Lindley's fault. No, I'm just kidding. Mm-hmm. Uh, but just I'll, not like, I'm just the marketing czar. Kate, Kate yeah. Lindley at drivelinebaseball.com. Uh, this is just like bad, some of the research feedback. stuff that, 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 that I think, you know, maybe shed some light on, onto like what we're working on. Because taking in a technology like this is exciting. There's tons of opportunities. Like one of which Lindley just talked about, I had no idea. And it takes like quite a bit of onus to validate everything, feel like we're going in a comfortable direction and propose solutions or changes or applications to how people should use it in a different way. Yeah. Yeah. It's something that I completely underestimated as well. When I heard about the modus acquisition, I was like, oh, heck yeah, we can like get it, jump right into it, make some changes, do this and that, like do what we think is going to make it more useful for the, for the athletes, for coaches, Mm -hmm. integrate our program easier, fix any problems that we might have seen in the modus validation that we previously did and just like get after it. But then like after getting into it, it was just like, there's so much more to it. And it's like, um, it's just like a much bigger project. So we're just trying to kind of get after it uh, step by step and, and hopefully make it a, make a pretty reliable product for, uh, for all. Yeah. So That's validation. Uh, yeah, buddy. You want, you want to pivot into that? Into, do, we're yo-yoing back from, uh, like, uh, research projects to talking about research projects to research projects to talking back about research projects. Yeah. We can flip to the next one. Training for research integration. Unless you guys got anything else on Modus. 
No, I, I was saying like this. This yo-yo is pretty funny because we'll switch back to romp stuff. Oh yeah. Um. But yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead, Brady. Yeah, I mean, one of the kind of like the main thing uh, last week, or at least the last two weeks. Um, well, I guess just now that we have athletes back in gym, um, we we've started like a couple new, uh, not really new, but adjusted initiatives, and gotten like more discrete things together, groups together, uh, like. We now have like a specific dedicated flywheel for athlete results, which we've always been like athlete results oriented. But now this is kind of like a specific task force that integrates like, you know, a couple people from R and D and a couple people from the skill floors to make sure that like we're on the same page in terms of like R and D creating things, experimenting with things, investigating things that immediately will impact the floor in some capacity. They can like, you know, get embedded in a way that they can uh, affect athlete results, whether that's like education for trainers, you know, scraping through our database of, of all the information that we have, answering questions that could help athletes, uh, building tools that like maximize and make those like processes uh, more efficient for like the skill coaches. And so, you know, one of those, uh, tasks or initiatives is kind of like cleaning up a bit um, or just providing a bit more structure to how R&D operates uh, in relation to the floor. So we want to like maintain uh, being well integrated to the, to the floors. We don't want to like silo ourselves off and, and keep that um, held away. But I mean, over the last, uh, you know, few years, simply just with like the growth of the company, you know, going from 20, 30 people to like 80 ish, uh, training more athletes, having way more skill coaches, um, and starting to get kind of like questions or ideas that we maybe already answered or already addressed, or they just don't really fit the direction that we're trying to get to. We just need like a better kind of like uh, workflow f for that to happen. Like R and D kind of used to, and has always been this always on entity, like an encyclopedia that you could just like ping uh, for info. And so we're all kind of trained in just like someone hitting us up and us being like, you know, dropping what we're doing and like answering that question or trying to work on this project kind of a thing. And an issue with that was stuff sometimes like not getting done or stuff just getting lost, honestly, like us saying yes to a lot of things and then it kind of just like falling uh, by, by the wayside a bit. So kind of moving, moving R&D more towards like, um, almost like a contracted entity in some cases where like if the floor, the skill coaches, they want something specific, whether it's like a report dashboard, like a large scale investigation or, or something like that, um, into it, then they can like outsource that work to us and we can like give it back. Um, and then still keeping the structure in place of, you know, you can just like ask us a question and we can, we can go out and find the answers that you know the skill coaches or those people wouldn't be able to get um on their own so uh kind of kind of just like creating some more structured systems to really maximize uh athlete results and make sure that they are you know getting better building building tools uh for the floors to use answering questions that they have giving them the discrete information that they need yeah caravan and i like uh month i don't know month or two ago like started kind of talked it wasn't as company like facing kind of talked about trying to uh stay on top of requests and everything but i think that wasn't um i think the whole company like wasn't on uh, like on the same page necessarily and there were also people that um like weren't here to, to hear that information so i think getting like the a more structured system having people responsible for it uh, having the training floor, like more understanding of what is like, what it takes, what the process is. And that kind of goes into some of the documentation that I put together about the writing like studies for the bigger projects. Yep. Um, I think that's going to be really valuable to just like improve like efficiency and uh, effectiveness. Yeah. yeah. I think, and I think even super, we have a super unique opportunity with the new space to train more mm -hmm. athletes than we've ever been able to train. Right. Like we could have, so many youth athletes, high school, college, pro, just like in our gym at a single point in time. 
And so we just need to like maximize what we're doing and what we're building in R and D to like have that data ready in the future for like investigations and stuff. And also just building tools to like make it so that our, our trainers can like properly train and provide results in all the different avenues because it used to just be a lot easier, right? It used to just be like velocity was the main KPI. You know, we didn't really do hitting. It was just pitching and velocity. Now it's like pitching is like velocity, you know, uh, pitch design now potentially like command work as well. And then now it's like you throw in the hitting side, strength and conditioning, you know, PT, all of that stuff. We have like all of these, you know, KPIs that we want to like address and monitor and really create uh, athlete success across the entire, you know, spectrum. It's not as, it's not as easy as it was in the past. It was just like, what's our average velo increase in gym? And if it's like good, then we're like, like so many other things. Yeah. Uh, I was just going to say, I, I think like one of the, and I don't want to spend too, too much time talking about this. And just like, <laughs> I mean, well, probably honestly a good portion of the viewers do work at driveline, but for the people I don't and don't know, aren't in uh research requests in R and D Slack yeah. channel. And there's like, the, what, what are you guys talking about? Uh, yeah. But like, I think, I think, I think even the third, even the third topic on our overlay <clears throat> is a good example of, of how this stuff like works and stuff. And, and a, a good example of how it was kind of inefficient, fourth, you know, like we've topic. made it work. Fourth topic. Which up? Yeah. But, you know, uh, got a couple related requests from, Dan Adams, head of HP, Bill Heasel, assistant director of pitching, and Terry Phillips, uh, our physical therapist. Director of Terry. Um, yeah, direct, I mean, director of physical therapy, if, you know. Um, so he, like, all, uh, there are a few questions about range of motion stuff. So as we collect, we have range of motion assessments, um, and that include, that's been going on for a couple of years. We have, like, movement screens, all that kind of stuff, similar data. And we have injury de designations in gym stuff I've talked about, I think, on previous podcasts. But essentially, Terry will conduct regular PT checkups on athletes and flag them as low elbow on, low shoulder on, low other on, depending on where the pain can be localized. I, I, as like a kind of, and, and sometimes he'll, he'll have a, you know, this is like essentially for athletes who are a little bit injured, but can still train when the training is modified. Their shutdown designation as well, but the majority of athletes will either be healthy or will have one of the low designations on. So we've had that for a while. We've had the movement screens for a while, and clear. Obviously, we've had the mocap assessment for a while. So I had a, I, we had a few requests about just kind of combining data sets together. Stuff like does the passive and active range of motion in the movement screen correlate with the uh, actual uh, range of motion when throwing a baseball under a mocap lab? How does that you know, how are those stats match up with Terry's injury designations, stuff like that. And, and like I answered a couple of them, then there were follow-ups, follow-ups across, across multiple threads, just spiraled a bunch. And I ended up putting together a larger base camp post on it with some findings and still have a few, few pending questions on that. So that itself is like, you know, when someone goes in and, you know, I, I, I personally have been not super on top of the requests because of the limited bandwidth, the number of projects, stuff that isn't going to go away. Um, but you know, I dipped my toes in this, I wanted to answer all the follow-ups. So like, you know, one or two simple requests can spiral easily into like a 10 hour plus 100%. project, which isn't, which, you know, which isn't to discourage anybody from doing them. This is why we're trying to get a better system, but that itself should have been a larger project and has been, and you know, we will have, we will tackle larger relevant projects. Some of the smaller ones, honestly, we'll probably, we'll, we'll, we'll have to, if we have the labor hours for it. I, Cause I think we've talked about this internally. We, we've had like lots of success leveraging research interns, shout out James Barber, now with the twins, uh, like really good at kind of like running with even the smaller requests and just giving out answers. Cause a lot of times the, the stuff and I've talked about this as well, the low key underrated part of a request is the, like getting the data, cleaning the data, making sure it's like fair, right? Like, okay, this data, was taken in the same competitive training environment or this data was by the same like tester or this data was from the same pipeline, mocap, matching all that stuff, having a large enough sample and then giving, trying to answer the question. Uh, so that's all a long way of breaching in our, our last topic, which like I mentioned, quite a few questions on uh, range of motion that I, that I posted about. Already, already switched the overlay over. 
but that, I, I do think you brought up a really good uh, point that mm. uh, about that kind of piece where like, you know, uh, there, there, there was a good period where, you know, asking, asking someone in gym ops, like where's a screwdriver was the same as like asking someone in R and D like a research question. But the thing is, is that it's not like a, an answer that's given in like five minutes because it usually turns into like follow-ups and then like more ideas. And then all of a sudden it's this like 15 hour project with like a, you know, thousand plus word long, like base camp posts, all that. Yeah. Stuff. Like and, and I, I, I can, I mean, I mean, to give a specific example, I mean, here, here's like an, an ex, I mean, anybody who's in driveline will know what I'm talking about, but I'll just give one right now. Uh, last, last, well, I guess it's not the exact last one, but one of the one of the recent ones. Um, ask questions about our 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 records for plyo velos and pull downs across flat ground and mound across ball weights. Something that is very worth knowing if you're a trainer. We've had informal records in the past. Maybe we could have done a better job keeping these records. But approaching this, so I, I like I I could give I could give a mediocre answer to this in ten minutes. Yeah. A very good answer might take me two to three hours. Yep. Maybe, maybe that's worth it. Maybe that's not. But then the question comes, if I, if I give that two to three hours there, you know, I should also like, why not give it to other questions that come in? Like I have to kind of pick and choose, but to give an example of why this is, this is not a 10 minute good answer. It seems, maybe it seems like a really easy uh, answer, but we we've collected, we've collected data uh, on like, all this stuff, like this is already different data inputs, but all this data is technically stored in track, but We've had different input data forms in track, the track backend, which uh, my, I have a lot of experience with. Other people, there's a lot of people I don't have experience with. If you have any, if anybody that's listening is really in the databases, the way databases usually work when you have a ton of data is you take in all the inputs and outputs, throw them as a JSON array, and plug them as a column in in a in a table. Again, I have a, I have a good amount of experience with that. But to answer this question, I go in. I pull in different d- tables, t- t- load in all that do- all those JSON arrays, split them out, split them out by playing level, split them out by ball weight. Probably do a little bit of data cleaning because there's there's still uh, there's still val- data entered in track, especially from years ago. And that's why I said I can give I can give a shitty answer in ten minutes. I can tell them since the last input data format, maybe we started that in like a year ago. Like that's the record. But if I want to give them a, an answer in gym over our years of training data. I have to put together all these different spreadsheets, throw them together, do some data cleaning, uh, possibly like possibly check some numbers, then come up with a table, spit it out, and then and then and then there'll probably be natural follow ups like, oh, okay, well, what about uh, not including these players, or what about adding this like kind of factor exactly. level? Yeah. Again, it's something that that I think is important and something we need to we need to do. But that's why like th- th- there and like a- answering that question can spur a bunch of follow ups. And there's already a bunch of questions like that and like getting a system where we're answering those, like we're expected to answer those right away. It's just going to increase the avalanche of stuff. And then clearly, you know, like all the stuff we currently have on our plate has to be weighed against like, okay, we'll also have all these questions coming in. And there's uh, more, so that's all to say, D Rose, I'll probably answer there's, your question, but yeah. not, not, not tonight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And there also, there's more people to ask those questions. Yeah. Right. Because yeah. we've just like, as we train more athletes, we've hired more people. And of course the new, the newer people are the ones who are like, you know, the most curious, uh, yeah. in terms of like having a question, they're just like seeing other people ask questions like, Oh, this is tight. I can just use the, the Google of driveline, which is R and D. It's like, what do we got on this? You know? Um, yeah. which again is really good. And we want to encourage that. And I think that's like the huge difference between like how we're not siloed off from those, uh, skill coaches or those like areas yeah. that like pro ball, other organizations kind of fall into the traps too. But um, yeah. we, we just kind of need to. Yeah. Again, the last, last thing I'll say, just reiterating, it's very easy for a lot of these questions. It's very easy for me personally to give a mediocre answer 100%. in like 10 minutes, but I, I, I don't want to do that. Like, I don't want to do, I don't want to set the precedent for that, but like a lot of these can be answered very quickly, very roughly. But yeah. to get like something that I'm that I'm proud of and I want to put out there on a co- like company facing platform yep. and answer and like be used as like the truth, you know, be referenced as an actual thing. Like yep. I, I, you need a double like you know, forget about all the different data sources, clean all that stuff. A- like if I'm gonna put something out there, I like double check it. I read through it. 
I make sure I got to ch- I got to check like, you know, does this match up, fact check something, all that kind of stuff. Like no- nothing, nothing good will actually take 10 minutes unless it's, you know, unless it's literally been asked before and it's like the link to a past one. Yep. I but, think, go ahead. I think there's still a uh, value in that though. And like, man, like that being a first, oh, no. like, uh, yeah, uh, we're just, just for like some of the simple ones, it'll be like, we yeah. have this database, this like spreadsheet or this, da- this table, basically it's already put together. Yeah. And somebody has a question about, do these two like biomechanical variables, do, are they related? And then you can yeah. just like, see if they are not or are they not? You don't necessarily yeah. have to like use all of the biomechanics data we've ever had. You just use yeah. this like one data set we have and hope that it's representative of the uh, entire data set and then be like that's And if there's nothing there, then just like, all right, well, we just won't go further. Yeah. yeah but, but, but I think, yeah. I also think there's a good, uh, kind of like, you know, uh, it, it's a good like training process for the people asking the questions to make sure that they're asking the right questions like that. Yeah, like, for sure. You know, cause you, you want to make sure that, um, you know, it's not just like shotgun, uh, questioning this thing or like having an idea, uh, going further and like kind of putting the onus on them, to like ask the right questions, uh, you know, in a way that's like actually going to be deployed. The information is going to get, you know, uh, uh, used or whatever. Um, yeah. And just, just be applicable kind of a thing. It's like asking the right question is a is a big piece of it, you know. Yeah, and, and I mean on my end, I, I I still wrote that 25 page data analytics doc. If you guys remember, where I tried like kind of making an encyclopedia of everything we've done yeah. that's yeah. relevant and where the data is and everything like that. And I've pushed it out a couple times, and I, I don't know if that should be like required reading before submitting a request or not. You know, I don't know if we can incorporate that or how. To, like I, I try to make it user friendly. I got some feedback from it, but there's still questions in there that like can be answered through, through that, that end. And, and one last point, I keep saying one last point, but I'm going to think Lindley, Lindley brought, Lindley brought up a good example. I think like to, cause there are definitely a ton of questions that can be answered with limited data, right? If we're talking about yeah. is a correlation robust, then, you know, we don't care about getting every single biomechanical data point we've ever collected. The relationship should be clear unless you, unless there's some crazy sampling bias, right? Unless, unless the, the, the data I happen to look at, is very different from the population than like a decent chunk of the data, whether it's like a couple dozen do- data points or if the data is like more, or if the column is more variable, right? If there's more variability, maybe I need like 30 to 50, 50 plus data points to get a normal distribution of that data. But if I just take like a random sample, aka like what our newest pipeline is um, or part of our newest pipeline even, that should be representative of explaining that relationship. I was, I was like this quick example I was alluding to was one where if we're talking like, you know, all time averages, all time records, something like that wouldn't like seems like a, you know, and, and it pro- and should be and probably will be next time someone asks that kind of question. But at the moment, there's still like, we still have quite a lot of like data sources spread out across different points and that have to be pulled together for answering some types of questions. But but I'm down I'm down to uh, getting a rom. Uh, I think I think maybe like the best way to do this is kind of do a quick overview of the findings I did like uh, internally, and then you guys can can riff off it and ask questions. And, and you can be at any time. I'm kind of just gonna walk through down my uh, walk walk through my down my base camp post. I think Ingles Ingelbrecht might be here in uh, ten to fifteen minutes. So okay, heads up. Nice. And, and shout out yeah shout out Max he actually gave me a really really nice gift. Uh, like in the last podcast when I mentioned he was like walking up. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm, uh, I'm a, I'm yeah. What you, what'd you, what'd you say? Flashman. Yeah, yeah. I'm a huge fan of the Flashman book series by George McDonald Fraser. If anyone's into like, I mean, I'll just say like pretty edgy historical fiction. That that'll be my. Uh, I mean, it, it's 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 really good. Uh, but anyways, he gave me he got me a collection edgy. of he 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 uh he borrowed one book and then it was like. Just like, you know, took, took, I mean, I wasn't like really pressing him on it, but he just took like a couple months to return it. And then he bought me the whole collection. It's like 13 books, dude. Wow. I was so, I was just like smiling from ear to ear. I was just kept texting him like, dude, this is a good gift. I don't want to get you now. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to try to get him something, something good as well. Uh, but yeah, past me, Max Engel break. Anyways. Okay. ROM, ROM stuff. Five minutes so, ROM. Okay. Uh, Probably not. <laughs> five minutes of just me doing ROM in the background. <laughs> Let's see if we can get through ROM, ROM investigation in five minutes. Five minute request. That's, 
Yeah, that'll take me that much time to read. But anyways, <laughs> so one of the one of the questions was one of the initial questions was uh, from Bill Heasel talking about basically like Rom in the movement screen matching up with Rom in the throw. So you know, passive active in, in the movement screen with actual with the actual uh, stress metrics in the mocap throw. So that that can be you know elbow varus torque. I, I did elbow flexion torque, elbow varus torque, elbow pronation torque. Shoulder horizontal adduction torque, shoulder adduction torques, and shoulder internal torque. Um, not too much, not too much there. Uh, I, I looked at like the normalized values too, which takes into account like body weight and height specifically to try to to try to pair out like you know some of the noise there. Um, not a ton there. I was looking specifically at follow up questions from Dan Adams, where the idea was I think um, whether or not. For the total passive range of motion, you know, adding the both both uh, you know, both the dominant and non-dominant hand, the sweet spot being 165 to 187. So I was kind of splitting up in, stuff in buckets. Uh, I personally didn't find any inflection points with that in our stress metrics. Uh, I know he mentioned there being a few studies showing that as a potential injury, you know, potential injury risk. Uh, we didn't frame it exactly in terms of injury risk but it would i didn't find any inflection point there and and th- those numbers marking whether someone has higher or lower stress that being said this 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 kind of bled into the other question asked from terry about the shoulder strength like active rom uh numbers being an inflection point or something that influences whether or not people go on injury designations so i looked at you know people that are measured green elbow First, low shoulder, uh, low elbow, low other, and found a couple interesting stuff. Um, specifically, and it, I kind of split it up by hands, and then I like, or sorry, by uh, dominant, or I, I split it up by, you know, shoulder strength, ER on the left side, shoulder strength, IR on the left side, and then I'm both counterparts on the right side. And for but reference, then I also, those are for reference. Those are isometric strength values that we yeah. do in our uh, assessments. Yeah. Um, and then I and then I also classified each hand based on the dominant or whatever it was a dominant side for the athlete. So I used like some people's ERL, some people's ERRs, and looked at like playing level splits as well, looking at the yeah the isometric strength on both the ER and IR. And I found a couple interesting things. Uh, mostly, the pro players tended to have higher values. And also the players that had no injury designations had higher values. Um, the IR shoulder strength was actually flagged. And I'm talking here for, from here on out, I'm talking about for the dominant side of the athlete. The IR shoulder strength value was flagged as significant at a Nova level for the pros. And it's actually something I, I talked to Lindley about yesterday as well, because back in the day, Lindley asked me about, because the general process when I'm looking at this, and I should honestly pop, uh, pull up what I what I told Lindley because I did, or what I told Mike. So I was especially good at explaining it to Mike. Um, but uh, the idea is you run a Nova for each comparison, and then if it's significant at a Nova level, you're running like pairwise mean difference tests. So a, a way to think about it is essentially that you're, you're good old-fashioned T-test with a few adjustments to count for you know running multiple tests at one time. So the Nova would tell me, if a variable in this case, like the dominant shoulder strength ER or IR, it results in significantly different means among the designated groups. So in this case, the groups were the injury designations, you know, whether no injury, aka green elbows or low shoulder on, low elbow on, so forth, among each of the playing levels. So I'm comparing pro green elbows to pro low elbow on versus pro low shoulder on. And and this example, and uh, on the pro level side of things, I found a, I, I found a nova to be significant for the IR strength, but when comparing the groups themselves, no actual comparison stood out as significant, which is unique. Finding an nova significant and not finding a pairwise, uh, not finding a pairwise difference to be significant. What it really means is, that, you know, the groups were definitely different when uh, controlling for uh, the dominant shoulder strength IR but not so different that any one comparison stood out. Uh, on the other hand, on the college side of things, interestingly enough, I found 
ANOVA to be significant for the dominant shoulder strength ER. And I found some significant pairwise differences there as well. I found that the uninjured, um, I believe I found, let me look at it just to make sure I don't misspeak. Yeah, so people who were classified as green elbow, so again, no injuries and low other on, which is a vague term for other injuries that don't have to do with the arm, had greater dominant shoulder strength ER than people that were classified with low elbow on for college. Um, so what, what this really means, you know, wrapping it up, I, I, I don't think these, you know, the, the nuances in terms of the pairwise comparison between the pro playing level splits and the college playing level splits probably, you know, probably doesn't actually tell a specific story. I don't, I don't put too much basis in the fact that one found a pairwise comparison, one didn't. What it, what it likely is probably just the size of the groups as well. I think there are probably more, uh, more players with one of the injury designations and one of the pro first college levels. I actually can look at it right now. So pro, yeah, call, we look. this is across 417 pro players, 671 college players, and then one splitting it up among like those, uh, those splits, I think. I think, yeah, I think the pros had like 360 green elbows, whereas the college players probably had like a, a larger chunk of, of people with the injury designations. So that helps kind of find statistically significant differences because there are the classes are more about, ba- uh, you know, more balanced while still not completely balanced. But the main takeaway being, like I mentioned, uh, the dominant isokinetic or not isokinetic, sorry, isometric strength. Isokinetic. It, yeah. Biodex. Oh, well, well I'm, I'm saying one of the things we haven't, one of the things still on my list is uh, matching this all up with biodex. Biodex but data. The, the isometric uh, strength values probably do play a part in um, telling whether someone is either injured or soon to be flagged with an injury. Mm-hmm. And because again, that's how we're defining injured. After going through a PT assessment of Terry and being flagged, as having low elbow on, low shoulder on, or low other on. Yeah. So that's probably my takeaway. Uh, what, do you guys have any takeaways or specific, you know, commentary or feedback? That was a, I'd say that was, that was pretty much what I was thinking too. Uh, yeah. When I was reading through it, um, I was gaining more and more excitement for the stuff that you had in brackets that was coming in part two. Cause I, yeah, I yeah. think like, <laughs> We were probably just like directionally thinking uh, the same or yeah. putting those in there forced me to directionally think that way. And so I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, that, that's like a the next step, I feel like, which would be really, really fire. Yeah. So. And what are those next steps? Um, matching the biodex, uh, actual isokinetic values with some of the ROM values and seeing how that data set looks like. And then doing a larger part on bringing in kind of more features or columns for the injury predictors uh, that like Terry essentially asked me to look into like the variation and explaining those injury designations. Um, so things like, cause I didn't, I wasn't, you know, I was looking at ROM and biomechanics, like mocap joint kinetics, and then ROM and injury designations, I'm bringing in stuff like, you know, the mocap joint kinetics to the injury designations stuff I've done before, but essentially rerunning for a larger data set yeah. Uh, actually bringing in wellness questionnaire feedback as well. So I think what I'm going to do for that, I actually started working on, I started preparing this data set a little bit yesterday. I think what I'm going to do for that, and I'm curious if you guys have any any questions or ideas, um, is I'm probably going to get the mean and variance of people's answers to our wellness questionnaire, which is stuff like, you know, just ranking on a scale of one to five. It's just you, you, you self-answer how your diet was the night before, how your sleep was, how you're feeling overall soreness, yeah. general muscle. Uh, I think that's probably all of them. You get like a total score uh, and then you, and then you feel that every day. So seeing if people can, if, if wellness, uh, if wellness questionnaire scores actually do help explain when someone's about to go on low other on low elbow on low shoulder on. And it's actually probably one of our, one of our largest data sets. Uh, you know, tens of thousands of people have answered and or tens of thousands of people's answers are in there. 
probably a thousand people have answered and some people have like hundreds of answers. Some people have just a few answers. And also like he wants to look at the frequency of filling out the wellness questionnaire, which honestly, honestly, I might bang. <laughs> I might not include that because I think it's, it's, it's going to be a little bit trickier yeah. uh, to really be able to tell based on someone in gym, or at least I might not include it now to give him like a, 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 an answer without that factor being built in because like I said, it's going to be, it's going to be pretty tough going through the days when someone didn't answer and trying to see if they were in gym or if there's a reason they didn't answer. This is actually, so this is like actually people, really fire. Uh, and just, just to bring up for later, uh, what we could do is at, just like an episode of we're uh, looking for something, we could review the thesis, like independent research project that I did because it was based on wellness questionnaires and subjective the one the one you did on uh, ups yeah and it was based on wellness questionnaires subjective soreness and velocity tracking on hmm. uh like 15 16 year old pitchers and like oh that's you know, tight and it wasn't great but the, the wellness how many points stuff, did you collect how many up? points did you collect how many data points did you collect uh every before and during and after every pitching session that they had for every pitch. so how many was that uh, I think like they all had at least, you know, 12 appearances, but it was for one team and a lot of data had to get thrown out. I think at the end of the day, I ended up with like six pitchers that had 10 or 12. It wasn't, it was not, it was not a very big data set because it was just like a summer yeah. thing. Honestly, yeah, I think my it really turned into more of a case study, but that was exactly what I was thinking about your point on wellness questionnaires. As I was doing, it was like, ah, wellness questionnaire tied to um data it, it was very very subjective we we, we have we have uh, just a drill and we have and just for the pitching because it's, it's on the pitching side of things since we're, we're bringing in uh we don't have the full-fledged mocap assessment for hitters yeah. so, uh, so just by default just by me looking at stuff like uh you know joint connects from biomech I, I, i'm already limited to just pitching but uh we have so we have sixty thousand. Jesus. Plus, Damn. well, this questionnaire data points just from pitching at driveline. Jesus. Probably a few hundred thousand if since other facilities use our well, this questionnaire. And then we have a specific one for hitting. I mean, not specific one. It's, it's the same thing. It just has like a different data input and track. So uh, we have hundreds of thousands of overall data points. But uh, looking at the ones I'm going to bring in, we have around like 60,000 60, something. Not to, not to like keep teasing uh, future work too much. Um, cause I know Jesus, we do a lot of that, but what? Oh, uh, Jesus, we, dog. Caravan and I just, uh, met with Dan Adams and we're hoping to do some research oh, yeah. on like range of motion, um, different types of range of motion measurements, uh, ice kinetic strength and how all of that is related to, uh, like movement and range of motion and the skill. So that is going to be really cool. And I'm really excited. It's, it's going to be a long project. It's turning into what's going to be a, like a pretty large undertaking, um, I know that, uh, we're also, uh, we're also hoping to implement something like a kind of an athlete reach out thing to like reach out to people who are not in gym anymore or, or who are like either online training or not online training and reach out, to see like how, how, how they're doing, uh, if we can be of any assistance, whatever, if there's any like injuries or if there are any like feedback or anything like that. So, and if we can get some data based on more long term uh, injury and performance data. Like, uh, Anthony mentioned when we were looking at one of the injury studies is that, um, surveil like surveilling basically athletes past the, uh, actual data collection yep. period is pretty valuable because a lot of times injuries from a program or injuries from a certain stimulus may not happen during this while the stimulus is being applied. So it's possible that like, if we get more longitudinal data with, um, as far as injury and performance goes, then e e like, despite the, the fidelity being a little bit, uh, it's just like, there's going to be more noise because it's not like measured in gym directly by us. It's going to be like subjective and, yep. and kind of self-reported. It still could provide a lot of value, like to kind of add on to, um, these, these injury, like, and, and just injury and performance investigations to, yep. to hopefully those things still matter. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. I think, I think, uh, give me Eagle Max Brecht, waiting. I think Eagle Brecht and Nate just walked in. So this actually might be perfect timing. Oh, try to get him on, try to get him for a 10 second spot on the podcast. <laughs> no. The track, yeah, man. We're taking the podcast to the swimming hole. All right. Let's go. Next, next episode. 
uh, probably guest. Some live shows coming. Special shit coming. Special shit coming. Probably, probably wearing, maybe wearing even less clothes. Next podcast episode, we'll discuss. We're out. Probably not. We're out. See you next Peace. time. Thanks, guys. Peace, everybody.